thanks a lot again. So it, it's really an honor for me to uh, to take part in the in the Foreman lecture series. And I'm really sorry I, I can't be in Florida today. I was greatly looking forward to spending some time with you people. And um, I had also already gotten myself a, a copy of um, Sibley's Birds. It'll have to be another time. At any rate, a big uh, thank you to uh, Roy and Erin and all others over there for coming up with this online plan B. So let me begin with a disclaimer that I recommend to anyone talking about cats. For the record, I have never kicked, shot, poisoned, strangled, drowned, suffocated, or otherwise harassed or killed a cat, nor do I harbor the ambition to engage in any of these activities in the future. I'm just covering my back with this with a view to uh, rule zero discussed in another Netflix show. Cats are cute. They are funny, they are wonderful companion animals, and they help keep mice from the house. But what happens when we let them go outside? Yes, that too. They can cause a nuisance and a health hazard to people, uh, but this talk is about wildlife. Cats hunt and kill wildlife like this unfortunate gecko and like this juvenile blackbird. And they go after anything that moves, rodents, rabbits, shrews, bats, birds, lizards, frogs, butterflies, dragonflies, and so on. And the numbers are big. We're talking millions and billions. Someday, my wife started asking me some hard questions, as she tends to do. Some of those questions she asked very appropriately in the place shown in the slide, the Forum of Athens, where long ago Socrates asked some hard questions of his own. So she says, Ari, you're the wildlife lawyer here. You always talk about those international laws on biodiversity protection and invasive alien species. What do they say about cats? How is it, for instance, that in the Netherlands where we live, one alien species, the Egyptian goose, is subject to control and eradication measures, and another, much more harmful alien species, the feral cat, may not be killed. In wildlife law, are some animals really more equal than others? And how is it that I will get into legal trouble if I shoot a bird without a license, or allow my kid to shoot them, or allow my dog to chase after wild animals? but that I can at the same time with impunity allow my cat to go around killing wildlife day in and day out. How is it indeed, ladies and gentlemen? Imagine our amazement when we found out that over a century ago, the American author of a book about cats was already asking this question. He wrote, we now legislate to protect birds, but place no limits on the increase in activities of their most destructive enemy. A man is liable to a fine if he kills a bird, but he may, with impunity, keep any number of cats to kill birds. Another statement from the same Edward Forbush that you, cast, you could fast forward to 2020 without noticing it is this. The widespread dissemination of cats in the woods and in the open and farming country and the destruction of birds by them is a much more important matter than most people suspect and is not to be lightly put aside. Anyway, we started reading more about the issues involved and the scientific research on the impacts of cats and on the legislation. And I'm saying we, because I have a few co-authors to introduce here. This is Han Somsen, professor of EU law at Tilburg University. And yeah, safety first. And this is Philippa McCormack, lecturer in law at the University of Tasmania. And this is my wife, the lovely lady Elvira Martinez Camacho, who started this whole project and made sure we finished it and kept us sharp with probing questions all along the way. A century ago, Forbush already documented a lot of interesting facts about the impacts of cats on wildlife. 
But especially in the last 15 years, scientific knowledge about these impacts has grown exponentially. The next few slides just show you the literature we came across in our research. And all of these sources are in our published papers in case you're interested. In our research, we focused on all free ranging domestic cats from pets through farm cats and strays to fully feral cats. That's to say cats which live fully independently from people. Free ranging cats can impact wildlife in five basic ways, which often operate in combination. The first is predation, that is simply ending other creatures' lives. The second is disturbance or fear effects. For instance, one study used taxidermied cats to better understand such fear effects in blackbirds. It turned out that even briefly confronting blackbirds with such a cat model near their nest reduced subsequent feeding of the young by one third and also led to a significantly increased risk of subsequent nest predation by corvids. The third effect is competition. When cats exploit the same food, space or shelter as wild species. Simply put, every mouse eaten by a cat can no longer be eaten by an owl or by a marten. Fourth, a wide range of wild animals can be affected by diseases transmitted by domestic cats, such as toxoplasmosis, rabies or feline leukemia. And fifth, domestic cats can hybridize with some wild cat species. Just to illustrate the predation impact of cats, here are some estimates of numbers of animals killed by cats each year in various countries. The key thing to note is that we are talking about many millions of prey items all over the world. In the US, the annual toll amongst mammals and birds even runs into the billions. To put those numbers into perspective, here are the US estimates for a range of human related direct causes of mortality. So if you are worried about wind turbines because they kill hundreds of thousands of birds a year, or if you're worried about the impact of power lines, which kill tens of millions of birds, then you should definitely be worried about the impact of cats. Here's the same information in a graph. As you can easily see, cats kill more birds than all the other causes combined. And here's a graph showing the results of a Canadian study, which are essentially similar. As a further illustration, here is a large scale global study by Roland Kays and others that came out just two weeks ago. It shows that pet cats kill between four and 10 times more wildlife per hectare than comparable native predator species. So forget about that line that you often hear that pet cats are just playing the same role in the ecosystem that would otherwise be played by natural native predators. So what can be done to avoid all of these adverse impacts? Sterilizing cats is an option and is the key feature of so-called trap neuter release policies implemented in many places to address the impact of stray cat colonies. An obvious downside here is that even if sterilizing a cat stops it from reproducing, it doesn't stop it from killing, disturbing and competing with wildlife. Another option is fitting cats with bells, bibs or other devices. However, none of these are fully effective in preventing predation and can in fact make other impacts worse. Take the beautiful color in the picture. It helps birds to spot the cat sooner, but that doesn't help nestlings and fledgling birds very much, and it only makes fear effects bigger. The third example shown here is cat-proof fencing, used especially in Australia as a last resort to protect vulnerable native wildlife in at least some areas from feral cats. This is of course expensive and unpractical at very large scales, and it still doesn't offer complete guarantees. For example, in 2012, a storm damaged part of the fence around a wildlife sanctuary in Northern Australia. A few cats got in and killed about 250 bilbies, 
a significant part of the species' world population. And bilbies are the cute little marsupials on the slide. So the only thing that really works is keeping cats indoors, or at least in a cat-proof enclosure, like a catio. That is to say, to keep cats under the control of their owners at all times, like every other pet. By the way, this has the added advantages that your cat will not contract nasty diseases, or be eaten by a coyote, or be flattened by a truck, or meet another untimely end in the great outdoors. So it's about time for the question, what's law got to do with it? International wildlife law in particular. In our research, we applied the good old formula of combining relevant facts with relevant legislation, added the rules of interpretation to the mix, and outrolled our conclusions regarding the obligations of states in this area. We found dozens of international legal instruments that have something to say about domestic cats, even if they don't expressly mention them. Within those instruments, we detected three main categories of obligations. Rules concerning invasive alien species, rules on site protection, and rules on native species protection. Many international agreements contain obligations to prevent and control the introduction of alien species that are invasive, that is to say harmful to native biodiversity. These include the Global Biodiversity Convention and Migratory Species Convention, two instruments on migratory birds, and a series of regional agreements for Central America, Africa, and Europe. A recent story that made the news in the Netherlands can be used to uh, illustrate what these obligations are about. An inhabitant of the town of Venendaal, which is right next door from where I live, released 80 goldfish in a canal because he considered this an aesthetic upgrade of the surrounding shopping area. When the authorities found out, they obliged the man to fish them out of the canal again, to the last one, because goldfish are not native to the Netherlands. Let's look at an example of a legal provision here. According to the Biodiversity Convention, each contracting party shall, as far as possible and as appropriate, prevent the introduction of, control or eradicate those alien species which threaten ecosystems, habitats or species. In the fish example, retrieving every single goldfish from that canal was apparently considered appropriate in this connection even if, to my knowledge, goldfish have not caused the global extinction of many species, if any. How about cats, then? Well, domestic cats are one of the world's very worst invasive alien species. As far as we know, cats were responsible, primarily or partly, for the global extinction of at least 63 species, comprising 40 bird species, 21 mammals, and two reptile species. Currently, domestic cats threaten at least a further 367 species with extinction. Two recent comparative global assessments both put the domestic cat in the top three of most harmful alien species worldwide. In terms of Article 8 of the Biodiversity Convention, how is that for appropriate? A second set of obligations concerns the conservation of particular sites. Such obligations can be triggered when domestic cats pose a threat to any wildlife which the site in question is meant to protect. The example given here is from a European treaty on bat conservation. It requires parties to identify sites of importance for bat conservation, such as roosts and breeding colonies, and to protect such sites from damage or disturbance obviously including damage or disturbance caused by cats. A third relevant category of law consists of obligations requiring the strict protection of certain species, often listed in an annex, typically including a prohibition to capture, kill or disturb animals belonging to those species, subject to limited exception possibilities. All of the instruments listed on the slide apply such obligations to protected species that are vulnerable to cats. And of all of these, Article 5 of the EU Birds Directive 
probably has the most radical implications. With regard to all native bird species, this provision requires member states to prohibit their deliberate killing or capture by any method, the deliberate destruction of eggs, the taking of eggs, and significant deliberate disturbance. The EU Habitats Directive mentioned by Paul before sets out a similar provision covering mammals, reptiles, and amphibians. The relevance of these provisions to cats obviously turns on the interpretation of the term deliberate. In a series of rulings, the EU Court of Justice has consistently held that for something to be deliberate in this context, no actual intent is required. It is sufficient that the actor accepted the possibility of killing, capturing, disturbing, or destroying the nest of a protected animal. For instance, according to the court, motocross racing in the habitat of the protected Cypriot grass snake equals deliberate disturbance. And setting up snares for unprotected foxes when there is a possibility that a protected otter could be caught equals deliberate capture or killing. As a guidance document by the European Commission puts it, the scope of the term deliberate includes unwanted but accepted side effects. And isn't that exactly what happens when I unlock the cat flap? In performing that very act, by allowing my cat outdoor access, I accept the possibility of the capture, killing and disturbance of birds and other protected animals and the destruction of their eggs. And because Article 5 of the Birds Directive applies to all birds that are native to the EU, not just to rare or migratory species, and because birds can be found throughout the territories of the member states, it is very hard to escape the conclusion that member states are required, under EU law, to ensure that letting cats roam free outdoors is forbidden and effectively prevented. And that is our first conclusion reproduced here. And our second conclusion on EU law concerns unowned cats. These must be removed or controlled when they pose a threat to protected species or sites. Regarding international wildlife law at large, we concluded that many national authorities around the world are currently required under international law to adopt and implement policies aimed at preventing, reducing, or eliminating the biodiversity impacts of free-ranging domestic cats, in particular by a. removing feral and other unowned cats from the landscape to the greatest extent possible, and b. restricting the outdoor access of owned cats. Now, nowhere did our legal analyses involve any rocket science, and I have to say we were not really surprised by these conclusions. What we were a bit surprised about is the apparent massive disregard and non-compliance when it comes to the obligations we identified. Wherever you look, cats continue to roam the landscape. And I don't know of a single country where cat owners are generally required under national law to keep their cats indoors, let alone a country where such a policy is effectively enforced. To understand this, we look to see what factors might explain and perhaps even justify this apparent non-compliance. Candidates include practical feasibility, scientific uncertainty, the interests of cats themselves, and the interests of their owners. With the partial exception of feasibility, we found that these factors at best provide explanations of non-compliance, not legally valid justifications. For instance, regarding the third factor, it's not clear that roaming outside is in the cat's own best interest. But for the sake of the argument, let's suppose that it is. Then we must ask this question. When applying wildlife law, is the pleasure which a cat takes in roaming free to be accorded greater value than the lives of all the wild animals that it kills? We did not find this to be the case in any of the legal regimes we analyzed or even at an individual level, to focus on the picture at the top right. Does the fun and excitement this cat derives from hunting outweigh the fear and pain of the baby blackbird or the distress of its parents? 
we have not found any persuasive argument to support such an assumption, let alone an argument convincing enough to justify massive non-compliance with international wildlife law. Regarding the fourth factor, for someone who now owns a cat that goes outside all the time, changing that habit is problematic. That's obvious. But that's no different than a smoker who for decades was able to smoke anywhere she liked and now is no longer allowed to do so in many places. It's always about a balance between some individual's freedoms, those of others, and the greater good. Smoking in public buildings and the workplace was banned because of increased knowledge about public health effects. Likewise, here we have the wish of individual cat owners to let their pets roam free on the one hand, and on the other, the by now very well documented great negative impact of free ranging cats on the public good of biodiversity. And we're not even speaking about the serious public health issues around free ranging cats. It's not obvious at all that the former should prevail, and not just prevail, but again, prevail to such an obvious and significant extent that it justifies large scale non compliance with international wildlife law. That basically left us with the hypothesis that the refusal of decision makers to address the free ranging cat problem, or even to call it a problem, is motivated by fear of becoming unpopular with parts of their constituencies. And that hypothesis received a lot of support right after we published our research. So this is more or less a short summary um, so far of what we wrote in these two papers. The first was published in November 2019, the second in February 2020. Both appeared in respectable peer-reviewed journals published by Oxford University Press and by Wiley with the British Ecological Society. And then something hit the fan and it hit it hard. By far the most interesting experience in the whole process has been what happened after we published this. This aftermath confirmed and taught us a lot about human nature and about the limited extent to which academics like us are able to meaningfully engage with the press, with the lay public, with politicians and with societal stakeholders like NGOs. Ecologists and fellow lawyers have generally reacted positively to our research. For instance, one newspaper quoted a law professor from Groningen as endorsing our interpretation of EU law, saying that the authorities should enforce the law against cat owners just as they have to against poachers or people driving a car through a breeding colony of birds. And another colleague at the University of St. Louis in Brussels decided to organize a moot court competition inspired by our research. As for the press, we, we offered one newspaper an exclusive first interview, which they published the day our first paper came out. And the University of Tilburg also put out a press release. And then our phone started ringing and never stopped. One camera crew after the other. The item made the national news in various countries. An absolute highlight for me was that we made the cartoon in my favorite national newspaper. I'm just pointing at a little bird here that says, officer, the dirty bastard has my wife. And then, of course, people had their say in the social media. The day after publication, I was teaching a class and students implored me not to look at Facebook and Twitter to spare me the unfriendly things people were saying about us and about our research. Anyway, if you were to consider attention as such, a measure of success, then we did pretty well. Our paper got the highest alt metric score, which measures media and social media attention of all law literature published last year, eclipsing publications about gun laws and about physical attractiveness and criminal justice. I hinted at the subtle sting in some of the reactions we received from readers, and I would feel bad not sharing some of the raw data with you. So here are quotes from some emails I got translated from Dutch and German. What an idiot you are, man. You really have nothing sensible to say. You did all those expensive studies and then start whining that all cats must stay inside. 
Did you fall from the crib onto your head as a child? Do something useful with your life, you retard. And another one, stop your driveling about cats. This could end badly. And is this what we call a professor nowadays? Someone who prefers to defend vermin? I call such people cat haters and dumm studierte unerfahrene frisch ersche. Trust me, that last bit just sounds better in German. These were some of the more eloquent reactions we received. Follow me now to a deeper level. I'll just give you a few seconds to read and digest these only slightly censored messages for yourselves. Also here you will find some German bonus content. Now, I've published, as Roy mentioned, about wolf management, rhino horn trade, trophy hunting, and I thought those were controversial topics. But I've never seen anything like this until I wrote about cats. Next level is politics. Members of the Dutch parliament hurried to reassure worried cat owners. Take MP von Martels. Mere hours after publication of our research, his own superior knowledge of European nature conservation law and about the ecological impacts of cats provided him with the confidence to declare that our conclusions were absolute nonsense, while adding that we should not make this issue bigger than it is. I agree on that one, it's big enough as it is. With similar confidence, MP Weverling ensured his constituency that this is, of course, complete nonsense. Europe has nothing to say about our pets. Both MPs, by the way, are from mainstream parties that are in the current government coalition. The executive branches of the Dutch and EU governments also reacted on the very same day. The Dutch Minister of the Environment basically pussyfooted around the issue without addressing the merits. And then the spokesperson of the European Commission free movement of cats that makes no legal sense of course so why does he say it other than from a knee-jerk reaction to prevent any further anti-eu sentiments from arising you'll have noticed that the main responses we have seen so far are aggression ridicule and dismissal out of hand where are the substantive arguments the real dialogue um, not here. Another Dutch MP, Geert Wilders, had this to say, as far as I am concerned, all cats can go outside whenever they please and let us securely lock up the lunatic pseudoscientists who make up this kind of nonsense. On the bright side, these two MPs took the issue seriously and filed written questions. To this day, however, the minister has only provided a set of evasive answers, dodging the key questions. Now, with some positive exceptions, the response of most NGOs, even big ones whose core business is bird conservation, was to distance themselves from our conclusions rather than embracing them. Again, apparently for fear of antagonizing cat owning members. To wrap this up, it is again appropriate to quote Edward Forbush. Questions regarding the outdoor activities of cats, he writes, in 1916, are causing much dissension. The discussion has reached an acute stage. Medical men, game protectors, and bird lovers call on legislators to enact restrictive laws. Then ardent cat lovers rouse themselves for combat. In the excitement of partisanship, many loose and ill-considered statements are made. Like old King Solomon would say, there is no new thing under the sun. Finally, there is this. It is difficult and costly to tackle most drivers of biodiversity loss, such as habitat degradation, unsustainable agriculture, and climate change. By comparison, addressing the free-ranging cat problem is easy, with significant benefits to biodiversity. This is low hanging fruit, and it's a shame not to pick it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ari. That was, uh, that was a great talk. That was, that was uh, thoughtful and thought provoking. Um, it, it also 
I, I have to say, uh, you, so you had the Ramsar convention listed on on there, and I've worked with the Ramsar Scientific and Technical Review Panel for more than a decade, and and we have dealt with issues involving uh, invasive alien species, but but we I don't ever recall a discussion about uh, uh, domestic cats, a and I think that also links up well with with Paul's talk in terms of definitions and definitions of species, but also what constitutes an invasive alien species. And and clearly on the impact that you've demonstrated, uh, domestic cats should be considered invasive alien species. Um, let's see, we have, we, we, we have, a, have a question from, uh, got a few questions I think coming up, um, but let's see. Uh, first one from Jess uh, Auli from University of Miami said, uh, should countries pass laws that prohibit cat ownership or just prohibit cats from ever being outside? What should the penalties be? Should we also consider dogs? Yeah, good question. Um, so all we did, of course, was, was, was map what, what international obligations there are. And, and see to what extent they're being implemented and perhaps not and for what reasons. Um, now, so uh, the, the question, I just lost it. Uh, let's see, quest uh, there was a question uh, on... Um, uh, yeah, sorry, I've got it. So, okay. Sorry, ownership or, or outdoor access. So what matters from the point of view of, of all of these international wildlife law obligations is the outdoor access of, of cats. So having cats as such as pets inside your house under your control is the same as for dogs, as for snakes, as for ferrets. Um, all of these animals generally have to be under the control of the owner, except cats. And, and, and we ha haven't found a good reason to treat cats uh, differently from all of the other pets. So that would be uh, my answer to that question. Okay. Um, let's see. We have a uh, uh, let's see. Um, question. Uh, question for Ari from uh, uh, Richie Cadell. Uh, firstly, thanks. Thanks for a tremendous presentation. Um, uh, also, uh, Richard, you you just want to unmute your mic and and uh, and and make your comments and ask the question. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Roy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Hey, Ari. How are you doing? Uh, great to see you. Thanks for, a, a, again, Somewhere. a wonderful presentation. Um, and I love the wolf on your cupboard as well, by the way. Um, <laughs> really, really interesting work. And um, just on a hunch, I was looking at the, the Council of Europe um, Convention on the Protection of Pet Animals um, while, you were, um, while you were talking there. And it was quite interesting to see some of the, the clauses in there where they, 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 they refer only to keeping animals in the household, providing accommodation, providing adequate opportunities for exercise, which presumably can be done indoors, preventing escape. But I was wondering if you'd come across anything um, that approximates a right to roam in wildlife law, obviously, uh, aside from the CMS, uh, or in the animal rights instruments for any animals who are capable of domestic, uh, domestication. And therefore, whether you, there was any scope for all the, the cat activists to, to kind of build a case that there is a right to be outside for these animals. Yeah, very, very important uh, topics. Thanks, uh, Richard. Um, so the adequate opportunities for exercise that you mentioned as as required by this this uh, convention on, on pets uh, in in Europe. Um, they should, according to other provisions in the convention, be offered indoors or on a leash or within uh, cat proof enclosures. Um, uh, interestingly, the, the um, convention requires owners to take all reasonable measures to prevent escape. Uh, but more importantly, there's a conflict clause. So the express statement that, quote, nothing in this convention shall affect the implementation of other instruments for the protection of animals or for the conservation of threatened wild species. Unquote. So that entails that the obligations flowing from the uh, birds and habitats directives would uh, re would uh, remain unaffected by by the pet convention. I hope that that's a beginning to an answer to your question. Yes, indeed. Sorry. Thanks very much. 
Thanks. Thanks, Richard. Uh, quite, uh, uh, from Paul Boudreaux, uh, thank you for a th uh, thought-provoking talk. Is there evidence that a home-fed cat is less of a threat outside than a feral cat is? As far as I uh, can recapitulate the, the, the literature that we studied, I'm, I'm not sure there is such a, this, uh, a clear pointer that, that um, uh, that that shows that so, so cats are very individual characters like people they, they've got their own personalities some are lazy some are very active hunters uh, of course there is the the important uh, distinction that um, not all pet cats hunt there are some pet cats that that are that just don't hunt uh, feral cats 100 percent of them hunt or they die because they, they they have to catch all of their food um, so, so that's an important distinction. But in terms of the the quantity that um, uh, of prey average killed by uh, pet cats and feral cats, I'm not exactly sure because it it cuts both ways. These these uh, fed uh, pet cats um, they don't need the prey for sustenance. Uh, but on the other hand, by feeding them and keeping them in good condition. They've got time on their hands. They don't have to spend time doing complicated things. They they can do whatever they like. And if it's chasing after things that move, then then they'll do that. So they might even catch more than feral cats do. We have a question in terms of the reaction to your to your papers. Um, have you faced pressure from university administration? Um, I have not. Um, I have to say, uh, the, the 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 person in charge of uh, the press release uh, was not very pleased with our findings, being a cat person. Um, so, but but she dealt with this very professionally, and um, uh, and then in the in the aftermath, uh, the uh, we we got some support in the form of um, increased vigilance by uh, the security department of our uh, offices. Uh, for a while after we received the uh, various uh, threatening messages. Uh, from uh, from Mars Campens, Mar, Mar Campens, uh, in your research, has the civil law perspective also been included, particularly from the perspective of the extra contractual liability that the cat owner may have? Uh, interesting too. Uh, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, we, we have not dealt with that in our research, but there's so much we did not touch on in our research and that, that, that is very interesting. So it's definitely an important component. Um, so for the Netherlands, I know, and I suspect this is similar in many places, that uh, if my cat would, would uh, run across the street causing a car accident and they can trace the cat back to me, then I would be responsible. I would be liable for that accident uh, because my pet was not under my control. So in the same way, I, I would be, so formally also under Dutch nature conservation legislation, I would be the responsible person for every bird that my cat kills. And um, I do know of an interesting case where there was a civil uh, law conflict uh, in court in the Netherlands some years ago, whereby one person complained about the neighbor's cats um, defecating in, in the neighbor's, uh, in the wrong yard. And the judge, in fact, ordered the, um, uh, the cat owner to, to keep better control of the animals and that for every time that would be another incident, they would have to pay, I think, one euro. What, what is the, uh, what's the, enforcement mechanism uh, for the EU birds and habitat directives. Uh, if, if, if member states are not abiding by their obligations, what's the mechanism to, uh, to require some compliance? Right, so the enforcement in, in EU law runs along, runs on two levels. So if there is non-compliance with, for instance, Article 5 of the Birds Directive, uh, one thing that could happen is that um, an NGO in this case would go to a national court and there invoke the EU law, so Article 5 of the Birds Directive in this instance. And I don't 
uh, I wouldn't be surprised if in the near future, one such case would arise where people just say, look here, Article 5 of the Birds Directive, um, the, um, uh, we know the interpretation by the Court of Justice of the term deliberate, one plus one is two, uh, the government should keep these cats off the street. So that would be really interesting. That would be an, a, an interesting test case. And the other level is um, uh, enforcement by the European Commission against member states that don't comply with uh, the law. But if the, um, the uh, statement by the uh, spokesperson of the EU Commission that I included in my presentation is any uh, indication, there's not a lot of willingness of, uh, yeah, uh, by the Commission to antagonize member states uh, over an issue like cats. Yeah, uh, Volker, did you want to, uh, did you have a question? So I see your video popped up. Um, okay, um, let's see, we have some other questions. You may have covered this a bit. Um, sorry, hold on just a second. Uh, so let's see. Um, it's noted that when, when dogs harm humans and other animals, they are put down in countries like the United States and that uh, owners face punitive uh, costs and, and uh, charges. And why are cats and their owners excluded from facing the consequences even after causing significant damage to biodiversity? I think you, you, you covered Good some question. of the political, political consequences there, right? Hmm. Uh, Let's see, Aaron, you've, you've noted that uh, there may be some questions coming up in the question box that I do not see. So if you see some additional ones, if you could please uh, just jump in and ask them. I think you might have covered this, Ari. Um, are there any advocacy organizations in the EU that are specifically calling for keeping cats indoors? And then you touched on this a bit. Are there other destructive animals that you think we should or could be regulating? Yeah, so so that issue touches on on the the NGO position. Um, uh, I know there's one small animal rights group in the Netherlands that that's taking the issue seriously. Um, uh, I know in, in the U.S. there's this, this wonderful uh, Cats Indoors program by the uh, American Bird Conservancy. Uh, I'm not aware of anything similar to that. So an organization uh, in a science-based way calling for win-win situation with, with uh, happy birds and happy cats. Uh, so BirdLife Netherlands was, was a quite disappointing experience. Uh, so like like BirdLife uh, UK and many other uh, organizations, they have taken this hyper nuanced approach to the issue for many years. And they also stuck to that when, when our research was in the press, um, citing difficulties with enforcement, um, stressing that there is still scientific uncertainty about exact numbers, about exact impacts of cats on particular bird populations. And then uh, around New Year's Eve, it struck me when I read a, um, so this is an interesting anecdote. Uh, when I read in, in the, in BirdLife Netherlands journal about fireworks, uh, they said uh, fireworks uh, is uh, a nightmare for birds. Uh, we can be brief about this. They said, um, the, at every year around midnight when, when we explode all these firecrackers and, and, and uh, rockets, uh, birds uh, in the whole country fly around disoriented. Some of them might even fly into buildings and die. And uh, they, they concluded uh, saying, uh, we should just stop this. And so that's one night, it's disturbance, some loss of energy, some dead birds, and not a lot of scientific evidence uh, propping this up. And yet they feel confident to call for stopping this damaging habit to birds. And then you've got the cats and then suddenly they go into hyper nuanced sensitive mode. And there was another part to the question dogs, some similar issues with dogs. I think dogs is running ahead of 
uh, regulating uh, cats. So in, in several parts of the world, loose dogs are still a major problem for wildlife. Uh, in some other parts, it's already regulated to quite some degree. In the Netherlands, for instance, it's quite strict. You, you cannot let your dog run loose anywhere except in designated areas. And if you do and your dog goes after a hare or a roe deer or something like that, they will try to, to track you down as an owner and you, you will definitely get a fine. I don't know of any cat owner that ever received a fine for what their cat did. So, um, Ari, I, I think you had, you had mentioned this in your talk, but is there anywhere even at the local level where there are prohibitions on, on allowing free roaming pet cats? Yeah, I believe there are some local uh, in New Zealand and perhaps Australia local areas where where uh, policies are quite a bit stricter because there the impact of cats is is um, really high on on those uh, native species that they have. Um, and we also found because one of our co-authors was was Australian, um, and she found that. Uh, the the reception of the research was not nearly as hostile in Australia as it was in in Europe. Mm -hmm. What was uh, what was the outcome of the moot court competition? Uh, it's taking place on twenty seven April. So, okay, okay, good. So, they're, are, they're, are they moving along in virtual rounds as well? Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I guess they will. It, it was a, a closed affair for, for only their university students, so I'm not quite sure uh, at what stage they are, but I, it was interesting. Yeah, so I'll, 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 I'd, I'd actually be interested in uh, speaking with them. Uh, 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 yeah, it could, be, it could be something that uh, we, we would want to do, uh, do more, more, more broadly, perhaps. Uh, yeah, and, happy uh, to put you in touch. Okay, all right, uh, thank you. Um, Let's see. Do we have other questions? Um, let's see, Aaron. If I'm missing a question, please uh, please jump in. Um, while she's looking for that, let me ask. You had mentioned um, that there was a question within the within the um, uh, Danish system. Uh, there, there's questions to Parliament. Um, or or questions from Parliament and and what's the what is the, the so what what does that process involve? Yeah, so it's written questions in Parliament uh, from MPs to the the competent minister involved, in this case Minister of Environment, and they asked a lot of questions on the basis of our research, um, and then uh, so the the minister gave these very evasive answers. So I'm expecting. Uh, there will be follow-up questions because um, she 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 dodged the question of whether she agreed that Article 5 of the Birds Directive and the interpretation of deliberate by the EU Court of Justice thus entails that uh, cats must remain indoors. She just tiptoed around that issue. And that's, of course, the question that they wanted her to address. So I, I guess this is to be continued. Uh, 